Welcome to the first NFT episode for the Crypto Writer Podcast. I'm your host, Joe. Before we get started, I think it's important to cover something. First episodes are the worst. Just go back to your favorite TV show and watch the first episode. It's rough. The camera angles look weird. Your favorite character has a strange haircut. The lighting and pacing aren't right. It's not the show you grew to love. It doesn't know what it wants to be yet. And that's where we're at for this podcast. I don't know what it's going to be yet. It's easier to tell you what it's not going to be. This isn't going to be a podcast that covers what an NFT is, what it stands for, or how to mint NFTs. There's enough articles and other podcasts doing that already. This won't be a hype podcast to talk about the new must-have NFT. This won't be a podcast where I tell you how to make money buying and selling NFTs. If you found this podcast, it means you've been down this rabbit hole and are looking for something more. Whatever that may be, we'll cover a lot of topics. There will be a lot of talk about art, music, ideas, and the capabilities and future of NFTs. Some of these topics might make you uncomfortable. But some people think that's what makes good art. I think we need to be having more of these conversations. So that's what I'm doing. For this first episode, I interviewed one of the co-founders of Women of Crypto Art, Etta Tati. Women of Crypto Art, sometimes called WOCA, was started by a group of women, for women, to help sell their art. It's easier to sell someone else's work than your own. When it's yours, you see all your mistakes, where you could improve, or why it's not as good as someone else's. And I think that's something almost everyone can relate to. It's grown from a small group text to a Discord community of over 500 members. These women know a lot about NFTs, know a lot of people, and are about to become a part of history in a variety of ways, which I'll cover here and in the articles I write for the crypto writer community on voice.com. That's where I cover how I was introduced to Etta. We've been talking for a few weeks now, and the more we talk, the more I grow to like her. I send her female artists that I find so she can invite them into their community. And she shows me the art that she buys. Simply put, we're just becoming friends. The conversation you're about to hear started around a tweet that lit a fire in that community. The tweet was innocuous enough, and at first glance, looks even supportive. All it said was, we need more women in crypto. Innocent enough. The only problem is, these women have been here for a while, and he didn't know who they were. It speaks to the invisibility a lot of women face and how women usually have to work a lot harder just to get the same recognition a man does. So let's start there. Yeah, so I see a lot of uh, tweets from men, not just on the crypto art side, but in crypto in general, saying, oh, I wish there were more women in crypto. And I'm like, I have a massive list as long as my arm of women in crypto. From, you know, Catherine Coley, who is the CEO of Binance US, to Laura Hilpern, to the crypto woman, crypto finally, the, you know, girl gone crypto, the list goes on. And so, uh, yeah, it's quite good fun. It's quite easy. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, getting these guys. And I was, you know, um, I mean, we've got 500 women in walk up. I can't call them all out by name in a tweet. <laughs> There's not enough characters. I was going to respond to that silly guy, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm too exhausted. Uh, exactly. Joe's got it. He's, you know, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> You're right. Um, you guys, um, like, <laughs> maybe um, Anne from Super Rare introducing us might be the best thing or worst thing um, possible because um, I am, you know, I don't need to be a delicate with how I describe myself. I'm an asshole, <laughs> and when I, when I like am passionate about something, and when like I feel something, like this is why I think um, I write like I write with my heart, and I have no filter. So like when I'm passionate about something, I'm I don't give a shit. I'm just going for it and 
meeting you and Sparrow and like just having this like connection with you guys, which is one of the most like fulfilling things I've experienced here. Mm. And um, it's like, yes, this is where I belong. This is what I can do. Like, I finally am in a position where I can do some good, you know, it's so yeah, like you being exhausted um, and you thinking to yourself, ah, Joe's got this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, like, I, I'm, I'm so happy that, like, that's a thought in your head at this point. Yeah, I mean, when, when we started Walker, there's so much to be done, and there was so many, so much negativity. Um, you know, well, why are you setting up this group that's just for women? What about non-binary artists? You know, what about men? It's like, look, you can all join. Is it, as long as you're all for supporting women in crypto art, you can be a member, you know, trolls, go away. <laughs> and so I was quite good at batting away the trolls in the early days. Um, and then there's, there's always going to be ignorant people who just don't get it. And, and part of WACA is about educating people, saying there are at least 500 of us. And, you know, if, you, if you're a traditional artist, oh, I don't like all that crypto art, you know, oh, JPEGs, then you know, <laughs> they don't understand. And some of them want to be educated and they're just scared. And they go, oh, I have no idea. I'm not good with technology. I can paint on a canvas, but I don't know where to start. I don't know about blockchain. So Waka has some great training courses. Angie Taylor, uh, before she was a crypto artist, training people hmm. in being artists was her job so she's got a lot of great starter material and we also have um, lots of blogs that various walker artists have written about what is crypto art how do i mm -hmm. explain crypto art to my mother-in-law you know <laughs> even basic level um, and then i usually point people to dcl blogger who okay. is an amazing guy so he's got a, a video on youtube for everything so if you want to be a crypto artist, he'll tell you how hmm. to do that. If you want to be a collector, he'll tell you how to do that. He'll tell you how to make money. You know, he's like my Bible. Um, and I think hmm. a lot of people follow him. And there's, there's so many good people educating. You've got Art Gnome, who's like really great art journalist. Uh, I've got a lot mm -hmm. of respect for him. And he's, you know, a real champion of crypto art and, you know, tells it like it is. He's a very good supporter of women as well. Mm -hmm. you know, and the inequalities of, you know, I think there was something, he, he printed an article once and it was like, if you bought every single piece of women's, you know, non-crypto art, um, the amount of money you spent wouldn't add up to one single Da Vinci masterpiece or something. I can't remember right. exactly the details, but he is really on the ball um, mm -hmm. with the inequalities. And you know he's puzzled as well it's like some of these women artists are amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> why are they not getting the same recognition as the men it, it just baffles me mm. yeah and i mean that goes back century basically is like women haven't had money to support each other men were the only ones allowed to create art like it's and that's what is still frustrating is that you know it's the 21st century and men my age um or even younger are like well it's the 21st century like you know we're basically equals now at this point aren't we and it's like no like people being born now are already fed up with trying to make things equal when we just started less than 100 years ago like even if we just go by you know our calendar years now like 19 <laughs> what 2000 years of history that we don't have a full scale of and you're already tired after you know one tenth of that like dude like come on and uh, it, i i get go ahead you go yeah so even through history sort of women and art has been suppressed i mean there's everybody's heard of marie antoinette you know mm -hmm. uh, French royal family and she would say oh let them eat cake and everybody knows that quote what mm -hmm. people don't know is she actually championed a lot of women artists in her court nobody's ever heard about that mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it does exist but you know the, what they teach us is, is about you know, the da vinci's and, and things like that 
as if they're the only ones that were making art. That's really kind of, I guess, where we start is um, that need for a community to support women where you got involved. Um, can you talk about that story of um, how you were invited into Women of Crypto Art, how you, like how this all started? Yeah, sure. So for me, getting involved with Walker was a happy accident. Sparrow had set up a group chat in Twitter for Crypto Art Women. And somebody invited me by mistake because they thought I was an artist. So I initially, I kept quiet and I felt like a fly on the wall. And it was absolutely fascinating to see the conversations and stories about what life was like for these artists all over the world. And I had bought art from some of these women and I was a fan. So I kept thinking someone was going to find out I wasn't an artist and throw me out of the group. So um, eventually I contacted Angie Taylor, who is like the national treasure of crypto art. And uh, I wanted to set the record straight. So I told her that I was very honoured to be on her list of women crypto artists, but I wasn't qualified because the last thing I had painted was my garden shed. <laughs> So he, she just laughed and said, I could paint her shed anytime. <laughs> and so, you know, I was still in the group. And then the, the more conversations I heard, I was starting to realize the challenges that these artists were facing to get their art seen. So some of them felt isolated and were being ignored and excluded uh, by the art world and from the crypto art world. And it kind of struck a chord with me because I've seen glass ceilings in other industries. And the, the women were struggling to find people to give them references when applying to get onto the big art platforms. And many of them were considering giving up crypto art because it, it was so hard for them to break into them break into and some of them you know they suffered the uh, what they call the Dunning-Kruger effect which is like a lack of confidence about your ability right 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 yeah. and and I you know I could see that they were good artists I really believed in them and I, I wanted to help them achieve the same levels of success as I had seen other people achieve in the space so in an attempt to level the playing field, I asked a question on one of the platform's Discord forums about the percentage of male to female artists on their site. And this started a debate. So I got a really patronizing response from a big collector on the platform. That's and surprising. He, yeah, so he basically <laughs> said, uh, that someone's genitals should be irrelevant when buying art. And if I didn't like the percentage split, I should go away and set up my own marketplace. And who knows, I might be very, very successful. And if anything, the platform needed more female collectors than female artists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so at that moment, yeah, I, right. I mean, I'm not used to people speaking to me like that. You know, I'm what a white privileged person, you know, like, wait a minute. And at that point, I understood exactly how the artists I'd spoken to felt. So I took great pleasure in replying that I was a female collector and that knowing the gender of the artist was a factor to give me context when buying art. So at this point, the collector did a complete U-turn, right? So when he thought I was a female artist, he completely dismissed me. But as soon as he realised I was a female collector, he totally changed his attitude. And suddenly he wanted to help encourage more women artists in the space. <laughs> <laughs> and then the funny thing was that the next week when that platform announced what new artists were joining them, 50% were women. So I'm taking that as a victory. <laughs> and it was yeah, at this um... point when Walker was formed. <laughs> Yeah, that is a victory that I think can put on a resume somewhere. Like, oh, I did this. <laughs> um, the sex of the artists, um, I think, is important to know. Like, that is 
every piece of art is telling a story. Artists are putting themselves into their work. Who they are informs the piece, you know? Like, to say that their genitals shouldn't matter whether or not the art is good or not, or mm-hmm. even worth buying, is missing the entire point of art, I think. Yeah, it's because I mean, art's very much open to interpretation, and a lot of artists mm-hmm. don't like to make a big deal about their gender, and so they have a kind of a androgynous gender and a, a right. name that could be, you know, man with non binary, whatever. Um, but I feel more of a connection personally when I do know the gender, and I kind of think, well, what was the artist thinking when they made mm-hmm. this piece? Um, so for me, it helps, and also, I mean. It's like this in a lot of artistic industries. Like if you take music festivals, for example, you know, mm-hmm. in all the sort of headliners, it, it tends to be, you know, male bands or whatever. And a couple of years ago, there was, I can't even remember which festival it was. It might have been one in the UK. And there was like a, a male band, can't remember who they were, but they said, we, you know, we are only appearing at festivals where 50% of the acts include females you know why should hmm. it be that all the headliners are men when there's just as many female singers out there and and i wanted to build an art collection that was balanced i didn't want it to be 90 percent male artists and 10 percent female artists so it was very important for me to know the ratio of, of art that i was buying right and to your point about um that connection with the artists, what they're thinking and stuff. Um, I went to school to be an English teacher, so I've Ooh. taken thousands of lit classes. And anytime I get to a female author, I have trouble relating to her. And Ooh. not so much just um, not the emotional or the intellectual portion of it, but I'm not a woman. Mm-hmm. I haven't had those experiences. And it's art. For me. And I think that is a perfect indicator as to why things are male dominated and why things are unequal. We've had all the power, we've had all the money, and we've had all our doors open for us for free, basically. And now women Mm. haven't, so it does have everything to do with sex and your gender. Mm. And whether or not you're a woman because men are still buying things that they relate to because they haven't had an alternative in a way. Does that make sense? Yeah. To your point about that uh, glass ceiling um, about women not feeling confident in themselves and we need to encourage female collectors to get into this field. You said the other day that you're kind of tired of this image of women as female bald robots in some sci-fi setting and how it's possibly turning those women off from crypto art and they're still set in their traditional art ways. Uh, You thought it was because that's just what's popular now, I think. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, the secret to what, makes good art is that there is no secret it's all a matter of perception so one artist or type of art may be considered amazing to one individual and rubbish to another and there's always new trends coming out so some people don't like spinning cubes some people don't like trash cans I mean personally I, I find the art where it's the bald sexy naked robots really boring um, there's just too many of them um, even if it's well executed. I mean, I've seen lots of examples where it, the art is very beautiful. It's like, God, not another robot. You know, I know it's a popular trend, but it's just not my cup of tea. <laughs> I think it's because it's this idea of just technology and the types of individuals that are in this field. And I think that's why it could be popular. But I like your idea of. Um, it being more about like, oh, this is a robot in a male dom- dominated field. Um, what type of woman do I want? Oh, one that listens to me and one 
that I can control. Yeah, you, you are a naked, beautiful woman that does what you ask and doesn't talk back. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> uh, exactly. I mean, that's Wait, the maybe, dream. Maybe I, like... <laughs> maybe I want a sexy robot. If I had a sexy robot, <laughs> right. I would just tell her to put her knickers on and make me a cup of tea. It's the perfect woman. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, as, a, as an investor, right, so I have to think about my art collection for the longer term. So some of it, you know, I will sell it in the, in the short term, whatever, but I, I'm planning to hold on to it, pass it through the generations or whatever. So if 50 years from now I'm passing on my art to my future grandchildren, I need to think about what attitudes will be like and what will be acceptable in the future. So if you think about, you say, 200 years ago, people, you know, many people thought slavery was acceptable. But now we're all absolutely horrified by something like that. So, you know, what's going to happen with all these highly sexualized images of, you know, female bodies, male bodies, whatever? Um, it might be, you know, acceptable now, but maybe in the future people will go, gosh, that's so exploitative, that's awful. So I, I need to kind of keep a balance. You know, I mean, everybody likes to look at, you know, pretty people's bodies, whatever. But, you know, as, a, as an investment, you have to think about the future. That's interesting. I never um, even considered that as something that I'd take into consideration. Like, yeah. is it, um, and this is where younger collectors like myself, because, you know, I'm more in awe of other people's talent and don't think I could ever get to their level. Um, so I can appreciate what they're doing. Um, is it, do you think it's also part of our history and like almost like a public record of what we thought in this time period though that was decent like how do you find that balance mm. between that investment for the future that you i guess you don't want it to represent you as a person like you're spending the money to preserve this in a way mm. and putting it in a time capsule for the future mm. I yeah. guess in a way you don't want that stuff in your collection. Is that yeah, how you I mean, look at it? Yeah, if my great grandchildren you do a sort of research of the family tree or whatever and they find all this art on the blockchain <laughs> that I've bought and they'll say, God, you know, great grandma, she was some sort of bigot, you know. <laughs> so you've got to think like that, haven't you? You, you want to be proud of your ancestors because they did good things, not because they were exploiting artists or exploiting men or women or whatever <laughs> i mean actually the you know the the beeple collection that went for 69 million last week which you know people that does all a massive favor you know we're all on the, the tv news crypto art amazing but there's um it's come out this week that there's some really choice pieces within the 5,000 images which you know i, I was quite shocked actually to, to see how on PC, some of his pieces of art were, and and it kind of got me thinking that, you know, it's supposed to be a like a, a diary or a history of the last thirteen years of American history with elections and stuff like that, and political events. And as an artist, he's probably had off days when he's you know not been in a great mood or not felt good about himself, and maybe his art that day was. You know, not a good choice and he's chosen to include these pieces in his collection it would be fascinating to know why he included some of these pieces if you've not seen the article then i'll, I'll send you it but i guess that's a difficult thing to find out and at this point i don't know if we'll ever really know what his thought process is because now he's had time to think about it reconsider it and come up with a response as to why he decided to include it um and unfortunately we'll never know and i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing like it's a good thing we're discussing it as to why it's problematic and i think that's important to have that dialogue but also if it wasn't included would we forget that there are still inequities and problems. I don't know. I don't know how to find that balance. Yeah, really. I know. I mean, if it's documenting the zeitgeist of the last 13 years, then maybe that 
it's how people thought over that time period. And and also the, the collectors who bought it, Metacoven and uh, Tubador, they're now coming in for criticism. Like, why did you buy that with these images? And they're going, oh, wait a minute, you know, we, we didn't study it. You know, you know we're, we're just collectors here, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's causing some quite fascinating debates. Yeah. <laughs> What do you look for? I guess not just the sex of the artist. What, what is your collection like? What, what do you look for? Um, do you even see... Actually, I think I know the answer to this. I don't think you see the importance of your role in all of this. You kind of are um, like me, and you are self-deprecating in the sense like, I'm a phony. I don't belong here. Like, I'm not an artist, you know? And you felt the need to confess to Angie. And, but we've talked before how uh, you and I both have roles in this world. Like, you are a collector and know how to analyze things and support people and get them onto a platform to showcase them to other people. I'm good at finding people digging through stuff and saying like, oh, this person would be good to talk to Etta. So is this person. And I'm trying to send every female artist that has a passion and needs support by other women your way. And it's, I don't know that I should feel good about it, but I do. I can't help it. Like when I see them connect with you, it makes me feel great because like I did something that mattered and I got them into the right spot where they can succeed. and. I know, I know you're you're just like all of the women in crypto art that didn't see that value in yourself or didn't want to, um, you know, build yourself up in the same way that I want to do for you because I think what you're doing is just as important as the women that are. Well, creating. yeah, I mean, you can't have crypto artists without crypto art collectors <laughs> so yeah, the, the role of the collector is good and when walker was was formed um you know i was like oh but you know this is all about the artist this isn't, isn't really me you know i'm not artistic um but I, I did want to help these highly creative artists to get more focused and organized I didn't want to manage them, but I have a background in leading projects and organising diverse groups of people to work together in sort of self-managing teams. And the artists recognised that this was a skill that could be useful for them. And they asked me to help oil the wheels, if you like, to get everyone travelling in the same direction. So, you know, we in the first week we got over, I mean, I think you can get up to 50 people on a Twitter chat, right? And then, you know, that's that's it full. And so we had to move to Discord and we got like 100 members in the first week of Walker. And we had so many ideas. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's have an exhibition here. Let's, you know, have a website. Let's have a DAO. You know, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, I'm like, stop. So I took down all the suggestions, I prioritised them, I listed them. I don't think I did anything that great. But, you know, they were, they were eternally grateful, like, oh, my God, here's somebody taking charge. And will you be the president of our organisation? I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> that's pretty odd. So um, we, we prioritised, you know, we, we decided to do an exhibition. Um, and Angie said, you know, I've got a gallery, the London Gallery in Crypto Voxels. So we, um, we got an exhibition with over 30 women artists and we arranged it in about a week. It was incredible. And um, Angie worked so hard to like hang all the paintings in her gallery and uh, things like that. And it was just mad. And the response to this gallery, this first ever all women Walker exhibition, was really popular. And um, we had over a thousand visitors that came through the doors of the gallery. Uh, and it was the most visited location in Crypto Voxels that week. So after it, I mean, I, I could sort of sense that. This was important. And so I contacted a chap called Martin Ostachowski, who's a crypto artist, and he is documenting the history of crypto art. 
and he's got a really cool website and it goes all way back to the, the you know the rare peppies and all the all the things that crypto kitties, the things from the early days. And he ag agreed to add this uh, she art walka exhibition to his timeline. So, you know, I feel in a way I've cemented Walker's history, you know, placing the history books of uh, crypto art and, and I'm in there as well. You know, it's like, I think there's a tweet that I put out calling for women crypto artists, you know, and, and at that time we had no idea how much it was going to grow. It was just been immense. Do you ever take and sit back and think, wow, like people might actually learn about people might actually learn about Angie Taylor and female mm. artists and Sparrow especially because she is okay. um when I spoke to her, like she was trying to explain things to me and I'm just like, okay, um I used to think I was smart. Now I know I'm not because of her <laughs> <laughs> like she just like i was like okay my tiny brain like can't even keep up with her and i'm just like going to nod mm. and smile but like you two like actually might be something people learn about in art history class do you realize the impact you're having on others yeah i mean i <sighs> I've had a lot of artists coming to me over the months saying, oh, you know, I might just give it up. I'm not selling anything. It's hard work. It's a slog. I'm seeing other people becoming successful. It's not happening for me. And, and I talk them out of it and I, I point out to them, you know, all the great things that they have done. And I'll say, look, your collector will come along. Your collector just hasn't found you yet. So there's, there's that side of it. There's the artists that I'm sort of supporting. And every t every opportunity I get, I'll I'll nominate artists for awards, you know. And um, actually, I love Josie Bellini. And there was this awards last year for um, the Wirex uh, Women in Crypto Power List, and I nominated Josie because she's like a real force, you know. She does all the Bitcoin art, the Ethereum art, and her and actually somebody nominated Angie Taylor. So they were both in the short list of the most influential women in crypto. And that's not just women in crypto art, that's women in crypto. So women are phenomenal. Um, and then there's the collector side. So I, I was a, on a bit of a personal mission last year to try and onboard more women collectors because most of the collectors I knew were men. And um, I, I did a talk in Crypto Voxels um, to try and tell the artists, these, these are the way we can try and encourage more women, you know, um, get engaged with chats with women. And I reached out to lots of crypto influencers, like your Leila Hailperns and the crypto women. And, you know, there's loads of them like that saying, have you heard of crypto art? You know, because for me, it was easier than like telling my next door neighbour about it. I mean. I talk about crypto art all the time and you know people I've known for years they just glaze over they haven't a clue what I'm talking about at least if you speak to women who already own cryptocurrency they know what the blockchain is they know what a wallet is they know what ETH is so you're halfway there <laughs> you just have to convince them you know don't spend all your money on bitcoin spend a bit of it on art <laughs> and the, the trouble that I had with that was I was tweeting and I was tagging all these ladies in and some of them were liking it, some of it were you know, retweeting it, but I had no way of measuring how many of them actually went on to buy crypto art. <laughs> so for me, it was a bit frustrating. Um, and, and obviously now it has exploded. And, and I, I had my own wobble at one point a few months ago as well. So I said all the, the artists who had come to me saying, oh, I'm giving up. I'm going back to my day job. And I had actually thought a couple of months ago, oh, I've spent all this money on art. Nobody's buying my art. I have a brilliant art collection, but it's because it's non-fungible. You know, I, I could have this forever and, you know, never be able to retire or whatever. Nobody's buying it. And I made a decision. I'm not buying any more art. I've, I've not got too much art, but I really can't afford to spend any more of my money on art if it's all going to be tied up in art for years. And then within a couple of days of me making this decision, 
loads of offers started coming in to buy my art. I couldn't believe it. So I think it was like fate. <laughs> and, and of course, once you sell some art at a profit, I mean, it's a great feeling. Um, although I always have mixed emotions when I sell my art because you know, it's you get to know your art and you love it and you look at it all the time on your computer and on your phone, whatever. And then when you when you sell it and it's no longer in your wallet, it's like losing a treasured sort of family pet or something. It's it's really bad. And um, I've had I've made so many mistakes with art. You know, there was a a piece of art I sold by mistake. I was absolutely gutted. Um, it was a piece by Coldy, and it was of Warren Buffett, um, and it was one of my favourite pieces of art. And I had put it up for sale because you should always put all your art up for sale, even if you don't want to sell it. So if you don't want to sell it, then you put it up for something ridiculous, like 100 ETH, and you think, well, nobody's going to buy that. So I had put this bit of art up for sale thinking, ugh. No one will buy it this year at that figure. It will be at least five years before somebody wants to buy it. And I had foolishly assumed that if somebody makes an offer on your art, you would get an email and it would say, do you want to accept this offer? Click this button. <laughs> but anyway, what had happened was um, someone must have offered the full asking price. And so what I got was an email saying, congratulations, you've just sold your piece of art. And I was like, no, no way. I love that piece of art. But it was gone. It was out of my wallet. And uh, I've made so many mistakes like this as well. It's, um, I'm constantly learning. <laughs> and I say to my friends, I make all the mistakes so that you don't have to. I like what you said about um, collecting because that's something I've talked with other people about and too. Like, how do you separate the, okay, I'm selling this piece of art, I'm making X amount of dollars. Like, I am in the process of selling some pieces that I bought, and I don't know if I'm justifying it to myself, that, yes, I'm going to use this money to support other artists, or if I'm just doing it for the money like you've been doing this longer mm. than me how do you balance that because i don't know how to yeah well whatever i've paid for some art I, i'll maybe put it up for sale at a figure that would give me a 300 percent profit margin um, because you have to remember that when you sell the the platform gets some money the artist gets some royalties so you, you don't actually end up with the full sale price um, but I mean, I've sold some art. I was very lucky because I got in about this time last year. I mean, one ETH was about $300 and I was buying art for like 0.75 of an ETH. It was just crazy money. Uh, and obviously now ETH's like you know, $1,800 or whatever. And, um, and so it's very easy for me to make a massive profit. That's just been I've been lucky to have been at the right place at the right time. And it is a bit harder now. But you, you just have to um, look at each offer that comes in and see if you want to accept it. I mean, it used to be like when I got up in the morning and switched on my phone, the first thing I would look at would be the price of Bitcoin. That was always what I, what I would do. It's like, well, how's Bitcoin? Is it up? Is it down? Is it about I think that's a lot of people's experience into... uh, with. Bitcoin at the yeah. beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is, I'm a hodler. I've got no intention of selling my Bitcoin, so it doesn't really matter what price it is. But I always used to look. And then I got into crypto art, and the first thing I would look at on my phone was Twitter to see what was new with crypto art world and what were the artists doing, what new bits of art were coming out. Now, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I check is my email to see who is offering to buy my art. So it's been a complete shift. And there's nothing nicer than you get an email going, 
this person wants to give you, you know, five ETH, six ETH, whatever the hell it is that they want to, to give you. And you're sort of mulling it over and going, mm, should I accept it or should I do nothing? It's just the, the best feeling. I can't wait till I get to that point where uh, I'm just enjoying and not going through an <laughs> existential crisis of, like you said, losing a piece of yourself or family or a pet. Like every time you sell something, I'm looking forward to that point in it. But like right now, um, like I have, like I've got like 10 or so pieces. Um, some I'm very emotionally attached to. Some um, I bought just because like I liked, um, they were cheap and I wanted to build up my collection. Um, but yeah, going through the process of trying to decide uh, to sell is anguishing and it's not fun right now <laughs> but i'm trying to look at it as like this is a long game and i would like to be um like at a toddy um and um be be able to be in a position to um financially support artists and be like yeah sure i'm gonna buy your small piece um i've got a platform i've got this collection people want to see this stuff of mine and what I collect. Um, come on in. Let me introduce you to some people. Um, and this kind of goes into um, how I um, jokingly say that, um, well, honestly, I don't even know if it's a joke anymore, um, that um, once we're able to travel again, my daughter's older, um, I want to go and meet all the friends that I've been making in the past like two weeks and come over across the ocean and sit down and have a drink with you and just like talk about the craziness of the last like two Ew. years in all of this. Uh, um, and I was talking to uh, Jen Stelkart the other day and I said something similar to her. She was like, oh, I don't even think you're going to need to wait that long. Um, I think within like six months or so, there's going to be kind of conventions for people like us where everyone meets up Ooh. in one spot and is just like, oh, here's such and such from blah, 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 and such and such from there. And that's, that's, I'm looking forward to Ooh. that. Cause like, I would, like, if I can say, like, oh yeah, I know Editati, um, like, I'm cool. Like, look at me. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna like name drop you everywhere I go. Oh yeah. We've been, we've been talking for like the last six months. <laughs> like, uh, we're good friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they're gonna go to you like you know this guy joe oh no, no <laughs> never i've heard never of met him, him before in my life <laughs> never heard of him <laughs> dear but yeah but um sparrow um when i was talking to her like that's what we talked about is that like these communities that are forming like she made the point that some of these websites might not be around in a year or two and i hadn't even like considered that because i'm so new in this but She's right. Yeah, some of these might not be around. They're still so fresh and having a lot of issues with, you know, selling, trading, and all these things that some of them might just be gone. And but the things that are going to last is probably women of crypto art. <laughs> yeah. And other communities like this. Because, you know, our personal connections are what's driving this and what is making this fun. Like the money is cool and it's allowing more freedom for us to interact like this and be creative. Um, but like, I mean, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't, would do this for free. I probably would do this for free <laughs> because talking to, talking to you, talking to Sparrow, talking to Jen and Karen and stuff like, honestly, it's so nice yeah. and it's just like so inviting mm -hmm. that if I didn't need to make money to survive, I would sit around and do this with you guys all day. I could do it all day. It's Excellent. incredible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's there's communities within communities. So obviously, Waka, you know, I'm involved in that community. But collectors have their own little communities as well. So I've become friendly with quite a few collectors who have similar taste in art to me. And that, that's usually how a conversation starts. And, oh, hey, I saw you bought that piece. I've got that piece. I like your taste in art. Um, and, you know, I've been collaborating with people like um, E.T. Young, who's like a big collector, 
score really to die for collection and you know they were coming up with strategies to try and promote crypto art and encourage more people to start collecting um, and i'm also writing a blog with my friend uh, johnny b nft and um, to try and um, dispel some of the myths and um, so myself and johnny we're both really into bitcoin and we saw this article it was called the seven misconceptions of bitcoin and we thought we could turn it into the seven misconceptions of crypto art collecting. So um, it seemed it's like everything. It seemed like a really good idea at the time. And I think we got to number three on our list. And then we both got really busy with other projects. Um, but we will come back to it because it's an important thing. I mean, there's probably a few other articles people have written on you know, like, why can't I screenshot it? That kind of argument. Um, or how can I display it? I can't hang it on a wall. These silly sort of misconceptions. But we will come back and we'll, we'll put it up on the Walker website and stuff just so that, you know, it's, it's there just to help anybody that's, that's got these questions. And there's, there's so many um, criticisms coming in. So since the whole thing that, you know, normal, what I would call normal people, who <laughs> uninitiated in, in crypto <laughs> art because because I'm like a crypto art crazy, um, and, you know the people are quite skeptical. It's like you know, but I can just copy it. You know, what is the value? Whatever. So I'm coming up with a a list. What I'm calling a fud list: fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, all about the the challenges that people get um, for crypto art. You know, it's like oh, crypto art's not environmentally friendly. How can you prove that you own it? It could be fraud. It's all about money laundering. There's all these silly, silly arguments that people come up with. And if I could, if I get around to finishing this list and publishing it, then people will just be able to copy and paste from it to respond to any trolls who are having a go at crypto art. <laughs> a lot of the criticism that's coming in to NFTs is from artists that are almost purists and don't want to get involved and it's mm. and again mm -hmm. it's just they're mm -hmm. scared because they don't understand the technology but we can teach them the technology we want to welcome mm -hmm. them into our yeah, world yeah <laughs> and that's what i think is important to remember about all of this is that like that feeling of being a part of something and with people is really what this is about because i th think technology like was supposed to bring us together and now we're starting to see the negative effects of twitter the negative effects of facebook screen time all this stuff like you said that like us being together hanging out being creative it's like a renaissance back to um you know like plato and socrates when they would just like sit and granted it was just a group of men back then so that's also problematic, but it's people sitting around talking about ideas and helping progress us as a human race. And I think that's the most important thing to remember of all of this. And I hope that's how we start to encourage people to come into our, you know, growing community. So, um, yeah, um, I want to thank you for talking with me again and again and again every day um i i'm telling people we're friends you don't have to you can deny it until you're blue in the face i don't care i'm going to keep telling people i've got a new friend and um i know this won't be the last time we talk oh, thank you so much Ada. i'll talk to you soon okay thank you take care I'd like to thank my guest, Editati, for coming on the show. And I'd also like to thank the DJ from Baltimore, Aiden, who allowed me to use his music for this podcast. If you liked it, make sure you subscribe and like so you can catch other episodes on the Crypto Writer Podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>